But now we have the geopolitical risk with Russia, Ukraine still taking center stage. Massive sanctions being placed on Russia, including not allowed to, to use SWIFT payments, which is a global system for countries to use. And if you notice over the weekend, guys, I read a lot of research on this, and I was basically, I must have had four or five people who are brilliant that I know send me information on this, comparing how cutting off Russia could result in a Lehman-like event, where once they allowed Lehman to fail, the whole entire system crashed, right? We weren't ready for that. Because there's consequences, not just for Russia, for everybody else if you do this. So if you notice, the market really got crushed over the weekend. If you look at the futures, they were down tremendously. And a lot of that had to do is going behind the scenes. And I'm not too sure if they highlighted this story as much. But when you look at Russia and their banks, I mean, you really don't know how much exposure they have. I mean, we have an idea, but Russia banks are not just holding Russia assets. If you look at Barclays, you look at Cited General, Credit Suisse, UBS... They do tons of business to the U.S., have exposure to a housing industry, commodities, everything. And you're looking at UBS, a good example, during 2008, you know, they reported $18 billion in losses from their exposure in U.S. real estate. So you don't know what they actually own when you cut them off. But from very, very smart people in the credit industry, very concerned about this move, which is why those futures were down 800 points on Sunday. The good news is, most of the smart people saw this risk. Central banks were well aware, ready to make markets. So I think like highlighting it and going through Lehman really helped here and said, okay, if we do this, what is going to happen? And I think they're not completely cut off from SWIFT. I think, you're, I think just some of it is. I'm not too sure. Back and forth, depending on what sites you're reading stories. I mean, the information is all over the place these days, especially with this. I mean, overall, when you look at the situation, I can't believe that Putin actually invaded Ukraine. And you know my stance on this. I just thought Ukraine was, you know, had, they had painted this picture of Ukraine being this nice little place. And, you know, I appreciate and I think it's remarkable how the president is, you decide not to, to leave the capital and get out of there and said, nope, I'm fighting. I mean, it's patriotic. It's really cool. But a lot of this was brought on by them. A lot of it was. I mean, you keep poking the bear, poking the bear, and this is what happens. And, and to be honest with you, I didn't expect this. I didn't expect, you know, Putin could have got everything he wanted. From the U.S. and Russia, and the U.S. and Europe would have been, like, from the U.S. And, and, and Europe, I mean, they could have got anything they wanted. The U.S. and Europe would have been seen as heroes. Peace. Look what we did. And Russia, you know, whatever agreement they would have signed with energy under the table, I mean, it could have been huge for everyone. But now the whole world, the whole entire world's against Russia. And they should be. Even China had no choice but, but to back down as, you know, they were under pressure by our government, especially who has the power to impose the same sanctions on China or anyone else is going to support Russia, which would absolutely destroy their economy. It would destroy. We can't do anything to Russia. We don't buy any of their goods. We buy everything from China. If we choose to buy it someplace else, holy cow. Make it more expensive for them, holy cow. But even China backed down a little bit. Now, how is this situation impacting markets and continue to impact the markets? You guys have seen oil prices still rise. I still think they're toppy here. Everyone's bullish on oil. You see back and forth. Things going to continue. You, you know, peace agreements. Every time there's a peace agreement, or they're sitting down to talk about, you know, how we could end this thing. Russia uses it as a way to bomb another city while these talks are basically taking place. You look at inflation. Inflation is going to keep rising, right? That's what higher energy prices do. It impacts every business, which then forces companies to raise prices further to keep those margins intact. That's why I still think there's a good chance the Fed will raise by 50 basis points at its March meeting. But the 50 basis point hike is not expected right now. It's completely 100% off the table. Off the table. Over the past three weeks with Russia. Interesting. Because if you look back three, four weeks ago, and this is the Fed Fund's futures, right? So this basically predicts on what you think the Fed's going to do. It was 100% four weeks ago that they were going to raise by 50 basis points. Now it's near zero. I mean, think about that. It's near zero. It was 6% last I looked. I think it's pretty much close to zero. The last time I looked, it was two days ago. I like to take the over on this. Because we know war does what? Creates even more uncertainty. But if we're looking at the data that has come out, I mean, it shows no signs of inflation slowing. Now, Powell is testifying on the Hill today. Tomorrow, you're going to hear a lot more about it, which is Wednesday. He's testifying for the Congress. I'm not sure what he's going to say to ease worries when it comes to tightening. 
And we're looking at every inflationary indicator showing no signs of slowing up. PPI, CPI, 40-year highs. Wages are rising. Energy prices are surging. Home prices still rising. Maybe that changes over the next two weeks. We're going to get more data ahead of the Fed meeting. I don't know. But if you're looking at the Fed and where we are, I mean, they need, need to raise rates by at least a half percent. I say at least because it's coming more and more. They're expecting seven rate hikes, nine rate hikes, whatever it is that changes on a, on a weekly basis. So who knows based on the firm that's predicting it. But they're so behind the curve. It's insane. With that said, we're seeing a steep decline in a 10-year. What does that mean? Well, let's do short covering, way of flight to quality, which is a clear sign of expectations here that the Fed is only going to raise by 25 basis points. And that's two weeks from now, I think, two and a half weeks from now. That's what the market's telling us. So if it's 50 basis points, expect a pretty big sell-off. I think it has to be more. I understand there's a lot of uncertainty with Russia. It's creating more supply chain issues. I get that data all the time, especially for chip makers specific to the auto industry. And guys, I got to tell you, it's taking another leg back. It was getting better. And this is why I said that the Ford CEO was full of shit and GM CEO was full of shit and saying the chip supply, everything's getting better. Is it really getting better? Try ordering a Ford. Try any. Forget about the EVs. Just gas vehicles right now. You can't order anything. You can't order a car. You're not going to get it for like nine months. They say, well, you get it four months. You're not getting it four months. Try to go a lot and buy a car to your specs. And when I say your specs, just your color. If it's not on a lot, which is like two or three cars that are on a lot that are brand new, you're not getting it. So they would, they would tell us nine months ago, things are getting better. Things are getting better. Now, all of a sudden, Tesla, who had no supply concerns, just warned last quarter, said, we are seeing supply concerns. Well, we're not even coming out with any new models, which is interesting. I think there's 51 new models supposed to come out this year. Was the Fed Mach 1 got the, the EV car of the year for 2022. Two page, you get, can't, can't get it until 2023, 2024. It's nice that you're the car of the year, though, <laughs> which is great. But now the data that I'm seeing in real time, this is from IHS Market. We just got taken over from S&P. IHS Market is amazing. Great, great quality research. Uh, every single week, they talk about these chips and how much supply is lost. Now you're seeing more supply being lost, meaning fewer cars are being sold because of the supply chain concerns. And that reverse, and I would say about three months ago, but now they're getting worse again. I don't know if that's through Russia. I have no idea. But I was very surprised to see that data. And that data just, you know, from last week. Nobody's really talking about that. Everyone thinks, oh, it's, it's getting better. It's getting better. It's not. Listen to the conference calls. There's a target today. Every one of them saying supply chain issues. Supply yes, but we're able to raise prices. Some companies are able to raise prices. Some are able to shift their supply chains and alert. But every single company's talking about supply chain issues more than they were nine months ago. Another risk. But you're looking at the markets and everything crazy. Guys, the fact that we could see the Fed Fund futures predicting what the Fed's going to do, and you're seeing that change, like 50, 75% fluctuations in weeks of whether it's going to be a 50 basis point hike or a 25 basis point hike, just shows you the massive uncertainty we have in the marketplace, which is why we're seeing so much volatility with some names are moving 20% plus in a day during earnings season. I mean, Square just served over 20% after earnings. It surged, and then we it's down tremendously off its highs. Umbrella just fell 18% out of nowhere. They seem to be doing great. Foot Locker down 25%. I mean, what's their exposure to Nike? Something like 70% exposure to Nike, and Nike's like, look, we're doing our own thing now. They're doing what Under Armour's doing. They're doing what GoPro is doing. They're going direct to consumer. This way they collect more money, higher margins, and it's working. They're their outlets. It's working. That reduces the middlemen again, which is Foot Locker, and they're getting smoked. Etsy went from 300 to 115 in four months, reported earnings, then surged 20%. Papa John's fell 24% in one day this week. That's just the past few trading days. This is just like the last three or four trading days I'm talking about, those stocks. Hey, we're seeing 1% swings. I mean, just if you're looking at the markets... On Monday. And hey, we're looking at a massive decline, followed by a big comeback, then another big decline. And then I think it was like five 1% swings back and forth within one day. 
I mean, holy shit. I mean, that's great for trades, great for algorithms. It's not really great for long-term holders who like read in the news and see what's going on. And you're like, holy shit, my stock's down 15%. I should sell it. And before you remember your password to your online, you're, you're up 10%. You're like, whoa, whoa I'm not going to sell it. <laughs> you know, just, that's how crazy it is. But stay cautious. If you're buying puts, you should be killing it right now. Start doing your research, do screens. You have free screens on FinViz, which is an okay site to do screens. If you haven't done screens, practice with it. It's just, you know, you can put in different metrics. You can find names that are down 20% plus that are still growing earnings by more than 15%, sales more than 8%. That means they're growing more than the overall market that have fallen. Get a list of, you know, you'll probably see whatever, just in the SP 500, at least 150 names, at least, probably 200 plus names. And then, you know, put in. Whatever, you can go through some of them and look at the different quarters. Uh, you know, did they warn? Did did they beat? I uh, one thing I would look at is buybacks. As companies announced a major buyback, we're going to see record buybacks. Seventy seven percent of the companies this week are now outside of that quiet period where they could buy back their stock, and their balance sheets are stronger than ever, even though we have inflation because earnings are at record highs still. And yes, they're starting to slow, but they're still at record highs, and they're using that balance sheet to buy back stock and increase their dividends. See which companies are doing that. You're not going to increase your dividend and announce huge buybacks. I mean, some companies announce huge buybacks when they report bad earnings to ease it, right? Say, okay, we're going down 20%. Let's allow, announce a buyback since you know we should be buying our stock. But when it comes to raising a dividend, that's a clear sign. There's a reason why all energy companies are raising their dividends, lots of companies are raising their dividends. That's a sign business is good. That's another thing you look at. But we're looking at the markets where there's clear winners and losers across all sectors. And this is recent with biotech, tech, staples, even small caps, large caps. I mean, it's not like energy where every single name is moving higher. Or like it was the past three years with all names across almost every sector are moving higher together, which we saw higher and higher. But there are companies getting it done like AMD, companies who aren't like PayPal. Google's killing it. Meta got crushed. It's recommended a really great supply chain company, logistics, encourage your research advisories down from its highs. It blew, blew out the numbers past two quarters. It's made acquisitions over the past two years, just everything clicking. Yet Gartner come out with, with a study. Gartner is a, a firm that, that I respect very much, consulting firm and technology, that more than 75% of companies are looking at ways to improve their supply chains, which is at the core of what this company does. So you see in not just areas where it was core business, but now it's autos, it's companies across every division, staples that, that are looking, you know, how do we make our supply chains better? How do we become rest reliant? How do we avoid the mistakes that we made, these delays, because it kills us. And the people that get that right are going to take massive market share, massive market share. But for me, I'm seeing incredible ideas right now, which you tend to see when the markets get crushed. But you have to be smart. I mean, take small positions, scale in. You're not going to get the absolute low and sell at the absolute high, which, you know, a lot of promotions say, hey, if you bought it here and sold it here, if you bought it here and sold it, just follow me. If you bought here and so they put a chart, if you bought here and you sold here, this is what we told everybody to do. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> uh, just be careful. All right. That's not going to be the case. If you're buying a good stock, it can go down 10, 12, 15%. If you buy in a small position or a third position, you're adding to it and you lower your cost basis. And this is why I do positions I intend on holding for longer than 12 months, longer than 18 months, where I want to be in them and I don't want to be whipsawed out because maybe the stock has come down. They had a couple bad quarters, but I'm seeing insiders buy now. If they have another bad quarter, you might have a washout. And I don't want to, you know, I know that that stock is worth a hell of a lot more and 100% more than what it's trading, double what it's trading, maybe 18 months, 24 months from now, but doesn't mean it can't go down 10, 15, 20%. And I don't want to get a complete wipeout. So what I want to do is, especially in this type of market, is buy smaller positions. Plus, it doesn't mess with your head. That's the most important thing. If you're buying a small position and it goes higher, you own it. You'll be pissed and be like, man, I was going to take a bigger position. But you own it. You're making money. And if it goes down, you're not pissed off because you're like, hey, I only took a 2% position in this. Or a small position, say a third of a position in it. And now you're going to add to it and you're going to lower your cost basis. And that's important to stay headstrong. Because when your emotions are involved, you do stupid things. And our emotions are triggered to always sell at the lows and buy at the highs. That's what we're triggered to do. That's why there's 
few legendary investors and everybody else because they figure that out and take the emotions out. It's not easy to do. Even I get emotional sometimes during trades and pissed off. But you want to change that. When shit hits the fan and things are down, that's when you want to be buying and buy good quality names. There's clear names that are working, the ones that are raising their dividends. Buybacks, those that have pricing power, those that are in the right growth markets. Companies that are not crazy, wildly expensive right now that need to blow out the numbers because if they report just decent numbers, they get crushed 20, 30% because they're so expensive, trading 100 times P's. If you look at sectors, look at gold. Hey, Russia has to buy gold. I mean, I don't know if you've seen this. I, I was amazed, but the reduction in US dollars and in treasuries that they have done, they almost own like no treasuries. And down tremendously over the past four or five years. And they want to reduce their reliance on the euro. Because those are two things that can really hurt them in terms of energy and dollars and euros. And why would Russia do this? Because they know. They have the playbook. They're like, look, we're going to do everything we can to take over Ukraine. You know, within a five-year period, right? And what's going to happen when they do that? Well, they're not in NATO, so no one could F with us at all. We know that Europe can't do anything because... You know, we supply all their energy. We know the U.S. can't really do anything. But they can play sanctions, which they've done for 25 years. So we're going to be able to take over Ukraine, and we're going to have some sanctions. So what is that going to mean? They're going to cut off our banks. Again, they know this. They're going to cut this off. So what are they doing? They're increasing their exposure to gold. And you're finally seeing that. And also, the reason why Bitcoin is going higher. Uranium. Have you seen uranium? And uranium is on fire. I've seen countries do about face, especially in Europe. I mean, a lot of you might not be familiar with the uranium industry, but Fukushima, when that happened in 2011, I mean, the massive overreaction, like every nuclear plant is going to kill the world unless you get ready. I mean, Germany said we're closing every one of our plants. Italy, France, everything, Japan, everything. No more nuclear, no way, no way. Even though it's the safest, one of the safest energies. But over 60 nuclear plants closed from 2011 to 2022 to today. So we now have 440 in total. And out of these... More than two-thirds are over 30 years old and whether you be retired in the coming decade or have their lifetimes extended. Now, this comes at a time when demand is absolutely surging. And it's going to continue to increase as oil and natural gas prices stay elevated long-term. And this is due to climate change initiatives which are not going no place, right? They're going to be here forever. doesn't matter. But imagine if there was no climate change initiatives or just they would dial down to the point where Europe was using nuclear, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't really care about what Russia is doing as much. And Russia probably wouldn't be able to do what they're doing to have that power because they do have power over Europe, over Germany, because they supply 40% of Europe's natural gas supply. Makes them pretty powerful. When you look at, at, at nuclear, uranium, man, this is an industry with massive, massive demand. Super depressed for such a long time, 10, 11 years. And now, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how much in terms of lobbying and those dollars going against uranium and nuclear. I, I just don't get it. To me, it makes no sense how the climate change crazies. I'm talking about people who are off the deep end, right? You know, they love wind, solar, but hate nuclear. And you're looking at, at uranium is cheap, zero emissions, so it's clean, 24-hour base load power, which unlike solar and wind, meaning you can use 24 hours constantly, you don't have to have the wind blowing or the sun at, to be out. It's very safe. Its land footprint is small, where wind requires 360 times more acreage for wind, and solar requires 75 times more space. But if you look at uranium, stocks have rallied over the past two weeks, but are still 20% plus off their November highs. While uranium prices are now trading close to $50 a pound again, that's just off their 10-year high. That's a great industry to look at. So I'm just trying to cover different areas. Because there are things that are working in this crazy market. 